This episode is brought to you in part by Vector Travel. Visit bookings.vectorstays.com and enter the code NYYRECAPS at checkout to get 10% off your next day. You're watching the 643 DP podcast with Derek and Patrick. The stream is about to begin. Ready. Derek and Patrick will be on in one minute. The six, four, three. Just what the doctor ordered. The six, four, three. This is the 643 DP podcast with Derek and Patrick. The show is about to begin. Hey, hey, little roll call. Everybody's joining. How's it going? How you doing, Patrick? Derek, I'm not going to lie. Like, that song really hypes me up. Like, every time I hear it, it just it keeps it gets me going. Dude, I love it. <laughs> love it. Uh, we got Hey Yo from CC Art. How's it going, everybody? So, Good news for the Yankees. They won one to nothing today. Not that anybody cares about spring training. Patrick, I watched your video the other day and I was laughing. You actually made a video. I, I got to say, it took cojones to, to make a video to tell your audience that the season doesn't matter. You're like right now. <laughs> yeah, I mean, listen, like I just felt like I had to do it. First of all, it did horrible views wise. And there was a few comments like whatever. Uh, but like, I feel like like my duty as a social media personality, if that's what you want to call it, is just to be honest and be genuine. Like, if I'm not having a good time watching spring training right now, like, I'm not going to fake it and be like, wow, this is the most entertaining thing about life right now. You know what I mean? That was a decision that I made really, really early on when I started doing podcasting was I'm always going to be honest with the audience, no matter what. Right. So that's yeah. a real, that's a really good, important thing for anybody out there who wants to do this type of work. Is that you got to be true to the to the audience? You can't put up a facade like, "Hey, I'm I'm super interested in what's happening in spring training," because nobody cares what's happening in spring training right now. But hey, look, yeah. the Yankees won one nothing today. Jordan Montgomery threw five no hit innings. Stanton was two for three. He's hitting three fifty this spring, and Judge got it going today. He was two for three. He's hitting two eighty now. So I like the way that things are starting to progress. Nobody major other than Zach Britton is hurt right now. You got to feel pretty Not good about it. Yeah. <laughs> Not yeah, way. no, I mean, like, obviously, you'd like to see these guys, like, perform well rather than performing bad. But it's like, I'm not going to get too excited over good performances in spring. I'm not going to get too down over bad performances so far, if that makes sense. Right, I agree with you. I agree with you. So uh, I asked Pat to kind of join me in, in getting through these last couple weeks of no baseball by imagining some of the numbers that the Yankees could possibly put up this year. So I asked Patrick to fill out a spreadsheet, and I did the same thing, where we went through the Yankees' offense, and we'll try and do the pitching at some point before the season starts. We might not do it next week. depends on uh, just schedule-wise, but we might do it the night before the season starts. We're definitely going to do a podcast that night. Uh, but we wanted to kind of put together the offensive projections and just kind of tally them up and just see what it would look like if everybody stayed healthy. So here were the rules. We tried to keep it realistic. You know, we didn't have any major deviations from anything that guys have done in the past. I tried to 
either regress people towards the mean or I try to plan a normal progression if I thought they were going to take a step up. And we plan for 150 games for all players. That gives you one 10-day IL trip per, per player or a number of rest days uh, without any major injuries. I mean, you can't plan for major injuries. There. You just can't predict baseball in that way. Uh, so I think these are pretty fair numbers. Uh, so, uh, pa- Patrick, do you want to start off and just tell me what you had for Gary Sanchez? And then I'll go through and then we'll just go back and forth. Yeah. Uh, so Gary Sanchez, uh, we're just doing average home run RBI OPS. So I have him batting 225 with 35 home runs, 84 RBIs, and 805 on base percentage. Personally, like this would be a very impressive year for Gary Sanchez. Uh, coming off like the season he did last year, I'll definitely be satisfied him batting 225. Patrick, I think we lost you. I think we lost Patrick. Okay, so we lost uh, We lost Patrick for a Am second. I back? Yeah, you're back now. You're back now. I think you oh, well, What was the last thing you heard me say? Uh, that you'd be very satisfied with the season that you you plugged in there for, for Gary Sanchez. Yeah. I mean, especially coming off like what the disaster of last year was, I think the Yankees would be ecstatic if they could get 225 with 35 home runs out of Gary this year. Yeah, I think that that would be a pretty solid season. I mean, that would be the Yankees' home run record for catchers. That would be a, what, a 40 or 50 point? I can't math. What's, what do you, 147 last year? So that would be like Something almost like 80, 80 point improvement in batting average. I mean, that's a reasonable yeah. expectation for Gary Sanchez. I actually got him doing a little bit better batting average wise this year because he's done it in the past. And I, I don't think that like hitting 238, which is what I have him at is that much of a stretch. I think he can hit 238. He's not a 300 hitter. He's not even a 280 hitter anymore. He's a swing and miss guy. He's hitting 240 this spring. So I've got him at 238. I've got 31 home runs and 80 RBI. So I've got him down a little bit in power from you just because I think that they're going to give more time to Kyle Higashioka this season uh, in order to keep Gary on the field and in order to – I think he's going to be the personal catcher for – Garrett Cole once again. I, I'm just not buying the matchup between uh, Gary Sanchez. Yeah, I mean, just watching them in spring training, he just he just still looks better with Kyle Higashioka. I mean, Higashioka receives that breaking ball in the dirt a little bit better than Gary does. And I know that to Garrett Cole, he'll sacrifice a little bit of the offense behind him for a better relationship with his catcher. Because if he's got a good thing going with his catcher, he's going to throw seven innings and two runs. And the Yankees are going to sure. do better than that offensively, right? So, all right. So that's what we have for Gary Sanchez. Do you want to do the backups now, or do you want to wait till the end? Or just kind of let's just go with Higashioka. Um, yeah, I was going to say let's just do the backups while we're at it. Um, so for Higashioka, uh, I actually have him doing pretty decent this year. Uh, two seventy six with seven home runs, twenty two RBIs, seven sixty four OPS. Um, I think I gave him like a little bit of a high home run total just because of the the sense that I don't think that he's necessarily going to be Cole's personal catcher to start the year anyway. But I think around like June, July, it's definitely possible that we see Higashioka getting a good amount of starts uh, with Garrett Cole on the mound. Uh, so yeah, I think that Higashioka is going to get plenty of playing time, especially in the sense of if Gary struggles at all this year. Um, so yeah, I think Higgy's going to have a solid year. All right, yeah. Uh, so I agree with you, but I, I don't have him to putting up quite the numbers that you do. Um, so I think Higashioka is is basically there for his defense, and we should we should fill in for people who maybe don't follow stats as close as we do. OPS is on base plus slugging, so the league average OPS is like seven seventy five, something like that, seven eighty. Like I think that, it's yeah. you know it's it, it varies from year to year, but it, basically if you do seven fifty, you're slightly under under. If you do eight hundred, you're slightly over. That's the range most people fall into. I've got Kyle Higashioka at 241 average, five home runs, 16 RBIs, and a 751 OPS. The reason I don't give him many RBIs is because I don't think he's going to be up there to hit with runners in scoring position many times. If he starts the game and he drives in a few guys, yeah, he'll probably drive in some runs. But if it's late in the game, you pinch hit for him with Gary Sanchez. Or, I mean, you're going to pinch hit for him with Gary Sanchez most of the time, unless Gary's really struggling. So I, I got him down on the RBIs a little bit, but... I think he's going to do okay. I mean, that's fine for a backup. That's fine for backup. Yeah, I would agree. All right, All right. so let's get to the first bopper. Uh, no pun intended. Me and the boys be bopping. Uh, yeah. Luke Voigt. What you got for Luke Voigt? Yeah, I mean, I'm going to be honest. Um, I think, listen, Luke Voigt had a 
ridiculous year in 2020. I don't think that we're going to see those type of numbers, but I do think Voight's going to bat around like 258, uh, 33 home runs, 102 RBIs, and an 884 on the, uh, OPS. So it might be a little bit confusing why the OPS is so high uh, without that many home runs. Personally, I think Luke Voigt is going to have a tremendous year as far as on-base percentage. Um, I think he's going to walk a ton in the sense of he's kind of going into this year being like one of the most feared sluggers in baseball. Um, and he's, he's going to have much more protection uh, behind him in the lineup. I think he's going to walk a bunch. And yeah, I think he he's not going to have quite the year he did in 2020, but he's going to be very solid. All right, so Patrick, I'm trying to share your stats on the screen because somebody requested it, but it's not working out. So I'm going to go back to the uh, to the main main screen here. Hang on. Yeah, I tried to share them. It's just not going to work out. So we're we'll, we'll just, we'll just going to have to listen. Uh, but yeah, Luke Voigt, monster year from Patrick. 30 and 100, can't complain about that. Luke Voigt's an OPS machine. Uh, 884, that's, that's nuts. I've got him at an 867 OPS, which is still pretty damn good. I've got him hitting 263 with 38, or sorry, 39 home runs and 107 RBI. So I've got him with six more home runs and five more ribbies than you do. Uh, you've got him beating what I have him beating an average, I think, by. No, I've got him up an average too. So I got Luke Voigt with a slightly better year than you have, yeah. but still pretty realistic. And and Luke Voigt is a guy that he could have a monster year. He could like last year he was on pace for 59 home runs. And he was playing with plantar fasciitis, which I don't know if you've ever had it. You might not not have, but I have. It's really, really painful. No, I haven't. It's basically, <laughs> as you get older, you'll probably have it once or twice. Your arch of your foot just Don't say it. that, Derek. Don't <laughs> say it. <laughs> hey, trust me. There's a lot worse things that happen as you get older. <laughs> <laughs> don't tell me. I'll, I'll find out on my own. <laughs> Dude, I just had to have a double root canal a couple months ago. It was nuts. Awful. Uh, mm. All right. DJ LeMahieu just signed that six-year, $90 million deal. And I'm just going to go ahead and, and spoil spoiler alert. You've got him at the second highest OPS on the team. Yeah. Uh, let's go ahead and hear your stats for DJ. Yeah, so I have uh, DJ having a typical DJ LeMahieu year, uh, batting 322 with 19 home runs, 87 RBIs, with a 926 OPS. Like, I don't think that there's any doubt in my mind that DJ's – at least going to bat over 300 this year. Um, I don't think we're going to see like a ridiculous amount of power, but I don't think like we're expecting that from him under 20 home runs uh, just by a smidge. But regardless, like we're going to get a, a typical DJ year this year. Yeah, I agree with you. I don't have him doing quite as well as you do. I think he's going to back off in average and his power is actually going to go up. He's been really taking advantage of that right field porch at Yankee stadium, but he's hit for such a good average the last couple years. It's just, natural for him to regress a little bit i mean he's not tony gwynn uh but i've got him hitting 306 22 home runs 745 or sorry 75 745 7 75 Imagine. ribbies that would be that would be a record <laughs> 75 ribbies and a 945 oh yes so let me start over 306 average 22 homers 75 ribbies 945 ops for uh, LeMahieu, I think that puts him in MVP category when you consider his defense. I mean, he's going to be a top yeah. five MVP pick, even if he regresses a little bit. Yeah, I would agree. I mean, DJ LeMahieu, he's a perennial MVP candidate, easily. All right, what are you thinking out of Glaber this year? He had a down year last year. You think he's going to bounce back? Yeah, I mean, honestly, Glaber's an X factor for me going into the season um, in the sense that I think he's going to have an awesome year because he kind of has a chip on his shoulder. So for Glaber, I have him batting 282, 29 home runs, uh, 96 RBIs, just going to miss 100 uh, with an 812 OPS. Look, um, I don't necessarily think that Glaber Torres is like that 40 home run guy that a lot of people think he is after his tremendous 2019 season. Um, but I do think 29 home runs uh, with like a 280 average, that's exactly what the Yankees are expecting out of Glaber Torres. And I think that's what we're going to get this year. So before we go on, I want to give an applause to CJ Cable. He's translating. And CJ, if you want to go ahead and email me at nyyrecapsdaily at gmail.com, I'll go ahead and throw you some swag when this is over. Uh, but he's translating for us all the stats. What a as legend. We read them off and put them on screen. So legend. Round of applause to you, CJ. Damn. Legend list. Let's go. 
Charge. All right, so I've got Glaber backing off. I thought it was interesting that we both picked Glaber to underperform his home run total from 2019 because he went off against the Orioles, if you remember, mm -hmm. and I don't see that happening again. I just I don't see him hitting yeah. 20 home runs against a team, basically. Uh, so I've got Glaber Torres, 271, which respectable. Again, not an average guy. 35 home runs, very respectable for a shortstop. 95 ribbies, 853 OPS. I mean, those are damn good numbers. He's not going to win an MVP for his uh, for his defense, but he's going to have a really nice year at shortstop. Could be a silver slugger in the American League for shortstop. Yeah, I think the only area we differ with Glaber is I think you value his power more, and I think I value his contact more. Just because like, I'm not too sold on Glaber Torres being uh, a guy who's going to hit like 35 home runs every year. Yeah, I can, I can understand that. I mean, again, the Orioles, he was basically getting served up BP that year. The Orioles had nobody oh, yeah. on the mound. <laughs> but uh, you got to think that they've learned from that. They're going to pitch him more carefully. But I do like his ability to hit the ball very hard and hit the ball in the air. And he's in better shape this year. He's got a chip on his shoulder, like you said. Uh, I could see, you know, I could see 35. So I, I thought about this one hard, and I backed him off from his career high. I don't think he's a 40 home run guy. The Yankees don't need him to be. I also think he's yeah. going to come out of games late in the game a lot because you're going to put um, Wade in there at shortstop, or you're going to. Oh. I, I, I think you know. I think that's just a, a realistic thing. Keep him healthy. Keep Wade in the game, uh, uh, and uh, you know Glaber's defense in in tight games. I mean, hey, you don't want to lose his bat. So it, you know they also might just switch Glaber over to second base and put DJ at first and take Luke out of the game. It really depends on who's hitting better. All right, maybe. Next, Next up, we've got Gio Urshela. What are you thinking about my man Gio Urshela, who played shortstop a little bit yesterday? Yeah, I mean, I think that that's pretty interesting um, as far as, like, Tyler Wade goes, but we'll, we'll leave that topic for later on. But as far as how I think Gio Urshela is going to perform this year, I have him with a 277 average, 21 home runs, 81 RBIs, and a 794 OPS. Um, when I was, like, kind of thinking about how the season was going to play out on the uh, left side of the infield there, Bro, I mean, is there – like, I know that there's a lot of really good shortstop third-base combos in Major League Baseball, but I think Gio Rochella and Glaber Torres is super underrated as a shortstop and third baseman. I mean, on that side of the infield, like, we're talking about Gio Rochella, like, very good defense, one of the top defensive third basemen. And then Glaber Torres is one of the top de offensive shortstops uh, when he's locked in. So I think that we're going to see a really big year out of those two, and I think that they have really good chemistry. I'm excited. Playing Crazy Boy wants a shout out, and I don't usually do shout outs, but I like his name, Playing Crazy Boy. Yeah, no, that's like that's the the key with me too. Like, if you're in my chat and you want my attention, like just have a quality quality <laughs> name, and then I'll just read your comment. <laughs> so, Gio Rochelle is a guy that I think a lot of people underrate how good he is. I've got him having a pretty good year, but I still don't have him hitting for much power either. I've got him at 287. I don't think he's a 320 hitter. I think he's going to have have 18 home runs and have 78 RBIs. It's a pretty respectable season. I think his numbers are going to come down a bit because of that surgery uh, because he didn't have a chance to really hit the weights and stuff this, this winter, and, and you're going to want to kind of ease him in a little bit so he might not play as much early in the season. You might get him out of the game a little bit in cold weather. Uh, but I do love his defense, 811 OPS for Gio Urshela. So, hey, look. I take either one of those those seasons. Uh, I got him with a little bit less power, but a little bit more OPS. So I mean, it basically yeah. out balances out. Uh, yeah. But you know, hey, Gio Rochella. Uh, Futai says Gio hit twenty five bombs and has a three hundred five average with eighty nine. I would take that. I'll take that. If he hit that, I mean, we're talking like that would be an exceptional year. I'd be flabbergasted. Uh, I'm gonna paste the link to this spreadsheet in the chat. Smart move. I mean, it saves CJ a bunch of time, too, but he's still a legend. Yeah. Yeah. So CJ's putting up the, the stats here. Boom. All right, so next one's going to be a boring one. We're going to do the backup infielder. We're going to do Tyler Wade. And I laughed when I saw your – I'm not going to lie. I laughed because you got him on the interstate. Let's hear your projection for Tyler Wade. <laughs> yes. Um. So I'm not going to give away your prediction yet, uh, but mine is definitely a little bit lower. Uh, I have Tyler Wade batting 189. With two home runs, fifteen RBIs, with a five ninety two OPS. Now, <laughs> let me just pitch? say, 
<laughs> Let me just say these numbers uh, might be a little bit low uh, compared to what his actual numbers are going to be. But like, I they're not too much of a far cry from what we can expect offensively from Tyler Wade. I mean, the dude has made his MLB debut four years ago. Every offseason we hear he's working with all these top uh, MLB players. Albert Pujols, Didi Gregorius has given him advice. The dude still can't find a way to hit the major league level. So my expectations offense-wise for Tyler Wade going into the season are astronomically low. Yeah, I, I, it doesn't get any worse than that. <laughs> it's, a, <laughs> it's a 189 with two two dingers. Uh, I've, I'm showing him a little bit more respect. I'm hanging a little bit up there. His 590, was it 592 OPS you had him at? Damn, that's like pitcher level, man. I'm pretty sure no. you, could, you could put up a 592 OPS. Um, Probably could. Like you, you could step in there and try and get beaned and have a 592 OPS. I uh, might hit 600 though. Right. So I've got I've got Tyler Wade at 233. Still, still not great. Four dingers. He's got a little bit of pop, but not a ton. 19 ribbies, 722 OPS. <laughs> that's I think that's a little bit generous. I, I put him in there with a higher OPS because he hits a lot of like triples and doubles because of his speed. And I think he's 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 not he's not horrendous. I mean, he had a couple of good he's games. Pretty, he's he, bad. He's pretty bad. He's I wouldn't start him, but, <laughs> but he's like, bad. Yeah, I think you might. I think you might win the prediction there. I just, <laughs> this, I, I didn't see it from uh, some CJ yet, but when it pops up, I'll post it on the screen. Uh, but I did post the link in the chat to anybody who wants to to look at these numbers. All right, I'm excited about the next one. This guy hit a uh, yes. home run yesterday, and he's quickly becoming one of my favorite Yankees, not only currently but of all time to watch. Like, there's something charismatic about Clint Frazier. Tell me what you got for Clint Frazier. Yeah, I mean, before I give my stats, let me just say I love Clint Frazier. Like, this dude's just the man. Um, but as far as – also, let me just say my prediction's kind of pissing me off on the spreadsheet because I'm trying to put in 280 for the average. But, it, like, the sheet keeps, like, getting rid of the zero, I guess. Yeah. But I have him batting 280 uh, with 33 home runs, 89 RBIs, with an 842 OPS. Now, I might be discrediting his home run home runs a little bit just because I've been a firm believer in saying that – if Clint Frazier stays healthy all year and he's the Yankees everyday left fielder, he will hit 35 home runs. Um, I'm just a little bit nervous to give it to him like just yet this season, but I think 33 is a, a good number as far as his home runs go this year. And I think moving forward at some point in his career, he's definitely going to hit over 35. I just don't know if this is the year for that. That 842 OPS is pretty nice. That's pretty it's, solid. It's pretty. Our, our numbers for Clint Frazier are strikingly similar. We're, we're both projecting a big year for Clint Frazier. I think he's walking in there with an attitude. What was the line from Moneyball? He's a guy that walks in the room and his dick's already been there for two minutes. That's the line. Something like that, so yeah. <laughs> Clint Frazier strikes me as that kind of guy. 282 batting average, so you know, pretty solid average there. 31 home runs, so I don't have him hitting quite as many as, as you do. Just because it's 400 feet to left center at Yankees Stadium. Uh, he does use right field quite a bit, though, so you might beat me there. He could also hit 40. I mean, I don't think either of us would be surprised. Yeah, no, it's possible. I've got him with 85 ribbies and an 833 OPS. And the way he's been playing defense, I think that makes him an all-star. What do you think? Yes. Um, I've I've actually said this on my live streams a bunch. I think Clint Frazier is going to be an all-star this year. Uh, I'm sticking to that. I think the dude's playing like – like his hair's on fire. Like I know like he has shorter hair than he used to. And maybe it's cause it's been lit on fire, but yeah, no, I think like he's going to have an awesome year. He's looking to prove himself. He's coming off uh, a breakout 2020 season. If that's what you want to call it. Yeah. I really do think Clint's going to be an all, an all-star this year. All right. I'm getting some numbers up on the screen because we got some people posting their own stats. Lori C says 38 homers, 275 batting average from like Clint that. Frazier. Uh, I, you know, I'd take it. Uh, THG Wicked 50 Cal mod of the century, by the way, uh, says, Legend. how do you guys predict Frazier's stats? His stats can be drastically different between, uh, depending on where he hits in the lineup. I think he's going to hit his way into a decent spot in the lineup. Uh, I think he's probably going to be settling at the sixth or seven hole, you know, by the end of the year. But as long as he stays consistent, you know, I, I just, I see him getting a, a, a ton of at bats. He's not a guy you pinch hit for. He's got that crazy bat speed. And I just, you know, I just like Clint Frazier. I just, th I just think that those numbers are going to be pretty close, pretty close. Yeah. No, uh, I agree. He says I Clint agree. only gets two concussions this year from banging into the 
wall. Uh, <laughs> Andrew says Clint could bat in the two hole for a lot of teams. I agree. And you know That's that Ryan a, Cashman's yeah. numbers had to be, or his phone had to be ringing off the hook last year after, after the season. Yeah. I mean, for years now, like, I feel like everyone just wants Clint. I've always said like, if Clint ever got traded to a team like Milwaukee, he would be an MVP candidate every year. Shout out to CJ keeping those numbers going. All right. The next one is Aaron Hicks. What you got for Aaron Hicks? Yeah, I mean, listen, I know a lot of people are not getting Aaron Hicks going into this year. I, I really like the dude. I think he's awesome. Um, 239 average, 22 home runs, 78 RBIs, uh, with an 868 OPS. Uh, listen, I think Aaron Hicks is super underrated in the sense of all this dude does is get on base. Like, we don't necessarily need him to bat 290, 280, because he has a ridiculous on-base percentage every single season. It's like it was there was a funny quote from him uh, earlier on the spring. I think he went like uh, zero for zero with two walks or something in a game. He's like, guys, I promise like I'm trying to hit the ball like it, like I'm not doing this intentionally. But listen, if he bats third, gets on base for the big boppers like that's all we need out of him. Man. And it's a super underrated aspect of the lineup. So that quote that he gave, he said, I swear I'm up there trying to hit something. He said that like two days after I posted my lineup video music video for him. And the lyrics I chose when he went up there to hit, like like when it showed his little preview, was "I want to hit something, trying to stick something." And and like I swear to God, I felt like he was giving me a little shout out, a little wink and a nod. Like, <laughs> saw your video, man. I'm loving it. I'm loving it. Imagine that would be awesome. That by the way, Aaron Hicks, if you see this, I'd love to have you on the show. I'd love to have <laughs> you on the show. Uh, all right, worth so, a shot. Right for real. Eventually, eventually, it's got it's going to be big enough that we'll get some of these guys on here. Uh, might not be till after the season, but but we're getting there. Uh, THG is not a big fan of Hicks. Says he's going to hit 17 homers this season, 229 average. I've got him at 234, so slightly lower than Patrick. 25 homers, so slightly off of his career best of 27, uh, and 72 RBIs with an 852 OPS. And again, those are really respectable numbers for center field. Excuse me, with his defense. I mean, that's just a really valuable player. With that OPS and his defense, that's a four to five win season, right? Yeah. But I'm also predicting, and it's not part of my actual prediction, by June he's going to be playing golf in Arizona with an oblique strain for, for two Don't. weeks. That probably hurt my chances of that interview. What do you think? You just uh, ruined it. <laughs> <laughs> we had a little bit of a shot, and now it's just gone. So uh, no, but maybe like, we'll it, try with Tyler. Wade. It's it's. I got to be fair. Look, we said earlier. Be honest with the audience. I can't hide the fact sure. that every summer he seems to have an oblique strain, and he came in this winter or this spring looking absolutely jacked. Have you seen the pictures of him? The guy can barely wear a t-shirt. Yeah, it's every year though. Every year. Do you remember that one off season where we saw a picture of him working out and he looked like Barry Bonds? Right. Might have been like before 2019, before 2018, one of those years. Let's hope he's not getting there the same way Barry Bonds is. All right. Who's ready for <laughs> who's ready for Aaron Bleeping Judge? Objection. I love that man, by the way. Just saying. Um you- I guess I'll go first with, go with uh, Aaron Judge. I have him batting 205 with five home runs. Can you imagine? <laughs> um, I have him batting 281, uh, 49 home runs. He's just going to miss 50. Uh, with 115 RBIs and a 985 OPS. Listen, That's I think stupid. I've – bro, I say this every year. This is the year Aaron Judge finally gets his second MVP. Like, I, I think that we're <laughs> going to see a, a fully healthy season out of Aaron Judge. He has something to prove. Playing with that chip on his shoulder, I have I have big, big, big aspirations for him this year. I think we're going to be seeing Aaron Judge show off that smile a lot this year. I think that's why he got yeah. his teeth fixed because he's like, "Look, I'm going to be smiling in the dugout a lot this year. I don't want that gap showing." Uh, and I got a big year for Aaron Judge too. Not quite as big as you have him. I have him hitting 287, 46 home runs, 118 RBIs. 963 OPS, and again, when paired with the best defense in right field in all of baseball, that's an MVP season. I'm sorry. Yeah, that's an MVP season. Either no way. And and look, we said before we started doing this, reasonable expectations for 150 games. That is on the like median range of what Aaron Judge can do. 46 oh. home run. He if he hit 56 or 66, I don't think either of us 
would be totally shocked. I was shocked when he hit 52 as a rookie. But having seen that and having seen how far he can hit a baseball, I think 46 and 49 are both in the realm of possibility. Yeah. I mean, if Aaron Judge has a fully healthy season, there's no doubt in my mind the dude is easily hitting over 40 home runs. Easily. I agree. Yes, I agree. All right. So coming down from that bummer, let's talk about Brett Gardner, who I think is going to get way too much playing time. We've got very similar numbers for Brett Gardner, too. Uh, What you got for Brett the Jet? Yeah, you know, for Brett, I was kind of debating uh, whether or not I want to go to the Tyler Wade route and kind of just give him, like, astronomically low numbers just because I'm not a fan of him. But uh, I was kind of generous to Brett, only because I agree with you in the sense of I think he's going to get a decent amount of playing time, so the numbers are going to be a little bit high, I guess. I have him batting 222, 10 home runs, 35 RBIs with a 705 OPS. Unfortunately, I think Brett Gardner is going to get a decent amount of playing time this year, uh, regardless of who stays healthy in the outfield. I think they're going to find a way to – he's going to play at least – if there's six games during the week, I could see him playing in at least three or four of them. Um, so he's going to play a decent amount of games. I don't think he's going to perform too well. But, yeah, that that's a typical Brett Gardner for you. So I also think he's going to get too much playing time. I think he's going to fill in for Aaron Hicks. He's going to fill in for Aaron Judge. He's going to fill in for uh, Clint Frazier just to give guys days off. But they also have – possibly Mike Talkman or Jay Bruce, who could get some at-bats. We'll talk about the bench guys because we kind of lumped them all into one bench player. Uh, we'll yeah. talk about him, them in a minute. Uh, but Brett Gardner, I've got him at 244. Not terrible, not great, but for a man of his age, that's about all you're going to get. 244, 10 homers, 35 RBIs. I've got him at a 775 OPS because I, th- I still think he draws a fair amount of walks, and he does work the count better each year. Uh, I do think he's getting a little bit too pull happy. He looked like he was trying to hit too many home runs the last couple of years. Uh, But I do see him with double digit home run power. Excuse me. Especially in Yankee Stadium. But honestly, Brett Gardner at this point is the fourth outfielder on the team. Uh, And if he can just play defense, play play his traditional solid defense, run the bases, score the winning run on a few different walk offs because he's in there pinch running, you know, hit a couple of big home runs. You know, just be a fan favorite, stay on the field, electrify the dugout, maybe smash a few bats, smash a few water coolers. That's what I'm looking for out of Brett Gardner. Keep pranking. Apparently, he's tormenting Tyler Wade almost as bad as you did with your stats. But he's tormenting. Yeah, I mean, I think the only thing that, like, bothers me with Brett Gardner is the sense of, like, like we mentioned, he's gotten a little too pull happy. Um, I think he's kind of, like, revamped his style to be, like, a power hitter. Um, I think I would prefer much better if Gardner would just, like, go like the contact approach uh, every time he goes up there rather than trying to launch one 500 feet and give the Yankees like a, a 270, 280 average uh, with five home runs rather than batting like 230 with 10. You know what I mean? Lori full one liner says Gardner gets the senior citizen discount at the movies. It's true. It's true. That's all right. I Matt mean, can't even get into an R rated movie. That's, that's <laughs> not true. <laughs> that's not true. By the how, way, wait, how old do you have to be? I, I think it's 17. Uh, no, you okay, well, I'm 20, so yeah. I'm wearing the 643 DP cap tonight, by the way. It's a nice hat. By the way. Um, all right, so let's talk about the big man. G-G-G-G unit! Giancarlo Stanton. You've got him having a monster year. You've got him having a more yeah. monster year than I've got him having. Uh, what you got for Giancarlo? I do, yeah. Uh, I don't have him as good average-wise as you do. Uh, would, he could definitely bat higher than 254, which I have him at. Um, I have him with 44 home runs. Uh, 108 RBIs and an 871 OPS. I put him in the same class as Judge in the sense of you could flip flop uh, either of the stat predictions I gave these guys, and either one could be realistic. They could even outperform these stats because I think Stan's going to have a fully healthy year. He's already mashing in spring training. Um, I think he's another guy with a chip on. The Yankees have a lot of guys with chips on their shoulders. Um, maybe like before the games, instead of sunflower seeds, they could just throw like a bunch of Pringle cans in the dugout. <laughs> just so they can keep stacking those chips on their shoulders. There's some dip. Because, They've like, already got the chip, man. Let's just throw them some red chips, true. some sour cream and onion. That's true. I mean, like, I truly believe, like, Stan's going to be fully healthy this year. He's going to put on a show uh, with Judge. It's going to be a sight to see. Uh, looks like the audience is in agreement. I've got Stanton having a pretty good year also. I've got him at 266, which, you know, about his what he does for his career. 
41 home runs, 110 RBIs. Now, people forget he hit 38 home runs his first year with the Yankees, and that was learning an entire new league. And then last year in the playoffs, he was hitting home runs like he was freaking playing on rookie mode with the freaking yeah. physics turned off. Insane. Yeah. Uh, and I don't know if he's going to be able to keep that up, but he looks really good. He's hitting 350 this spring. He's hitting the ball real, real hard. The other day, he hit a, uh, a fly out to the warning track that was 120 miles an hour off yeah. the bat. Now, how much would that piss you off if you hit a ball 120 miles an hour and it was an out? You know, I would probably just pat myself on the back because if I could do that, uh, I'd be making a shit ton of money. So, yeah. Frank Serratus says, Stanton will go berserker. Word to Kevin Smith. Uh, word to uh, Clerks. Yeah, so, so John Carlo, big year for John Carlo. And again, these are stats based on 150 games. And then for the last bench spot, this is the, the cumulative of the last player. We've got a combination of guys in here. Jay Bruce, Miguel N. Duhar, Mike Ford, Mike Tockman, freaking Tyro Estrada, Derek Dietrich. Any of these guys that, that could come up, I just kind of made like an amalgamation of sort of like the the tenth man or whatever it is, the thirteenth yeah. man. I don't even know what the number is. Uh, but let's hear what you got for for the last bench spot, and then we'll go over the final stats that we came up to because I think the cumulative stats are interesting uh, to see how much they break the major league home run record by because we both got them breaking the home run record. Yeah. Uh, so I have the that final spot uh, batting two fifty with fifteen home runs, forty one RBIs, and a seven twenty eight OPS. Uh, personally, I think that that final spot. Most of the playing time is going to be Jay Bruce. Uh, he's kind of like positioned himself this spring in a very good spot to start the season with that final bench spot. Um, I really like Jay Bruce, and I think that if he gets a decent amount of playing time this year, I saw somebody in the chat said 2012 Raul Ibanez. I think that that's a great comparison yeah. for 2021 uh, Jay Bruce. If he could be Raul Ibanez for the Yankees this year, that would be a dream scenario. Dude, those home runs in the playoffs that year. I don't know if I've gone that Stupid. nuts in the last decade. That was crazy. 12-year-old Patrick was ecstatic. Yeah, that was amazing. <laughs> uh, so, I mean, that's, those, that's fair. 15 homers out of that group, which puts your team total for home runs at 319. So we'll yeah. get to, get over to my – for my amalgamation player, I've also got 15 homers, 235 average, 755 OPS. So basically a replacement player. Right? I mean, those are replacement player numbers over the course of 150 games. That puts me at 322 home runs. The major league record, I believe, is 303 by the Twins. Is it 303 or 304? Yeah. It's like one of those. I think it's 303. I think it's 303, I think. Google, somebody Google that real quick. It's in, It's either 303 or 304. Uh, but we've both got the Yankees. If they stay 307. healthy. 307. Okay, so yeah. we've both got the Yankees breaking the home run record by a significant amount. You've got them beating it by 12. I've got them beating it by 15. Basically, the entire bench puts the Yankees over the top. And then just to show you how realistic these are, these numbers are, I've got the we, – we did the average OPS for the team, right? We tallied that up based on what we project, projected. And my my OPS for the entire team came out to be 831 which is one point lower than they had in 2019 when they had 306, I think. And that was 832. So off by one one tick. Uh, yeah. And then you've got them at 813, which is a drop-off of 19 points from Heavy 2019. Yeah. From the next man up 2019 team. So I think that these numbers are well, well within reach. And it's going to be a freaking fun year. We got how many days? To, what, 15 days until opening day? I'm counting down the days on my calendar, Derek. Like, I cannot wait for the regular season to start. I just want to watch baseball games that mean something. You know what I mean? Like, I want to, like, feel invested again. Like, right. I was invested in the first game of spring. But then I'm like, I get the reminder, like, oh, wait, like, this actually means nothing. So I can't yeah. get invested. But opening day, I'm I'm locked in. So locked in. We got the guy on the screen right now, Jordan Montgomery. I'm hella hyped as to what he's doing this spring. He's 3 0 with a 0 0.90 ERA. And I know that spring stats don't matter, but when a guy is pitching really, really well in spring training, like he comes in locked and loaded, 
that tells me, I mean, it's, it's, it's easy in spring to have bad numbers. I've seen a lot of guys have bad yeah. pitching numbers in spring. Uh, by the way, thank you to Jesus Chavez for the super chat. Uh, let's see. Legend. Oh, appreciate Legend. it. 100 underlined twice. <laughs> uh, so in spring, you don't have the double deck. So you got that short, like usually it's like a one deck, like a minor league ballpark. And that allows the wind to either knock down balls or to take balls out. And and we see a lot of times in spring training, these home run aided uh, or wind aided home runs. We see that a lot in spring training. And so, so when somebody pitches extraordinarily well in spring, I think they're keeping the ball down. You know, they're, they're not allowing hard contact and that's Jordan Montgomery's MO. He throws soft ground balls. He jams guys. And I'm about as big a fanboy as it gets for Jordan Montgomery. So I'm really excited about what he did. Uh, today, Are you? I'm a big, 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 big. That's an interesting guy to be a fanboy of. Very well, interesting up, guy. I grew up watching Andy Pettit, and he was like my favorite pitcher to watch. Man, he was just so consistent, you know. And and he he just wanted to beat you every time. He was just he would just win with moxie and guts and cutters. It was just fun. You know who always compares Jordan Montgomery to Andy Pettit? Who's that? Para on my team. He oh, looks yeah. like Gary Sanchez. Yeah. He compares him to Pettit all the time. And I call him crazy just because, like, they're not, like, the same pitcher at all and, like, career-wise. But, I, like, as time has gone on, I kind of see how there's, like, somewhat of a comparison. I mean, it's easy to make that comparison because they're both, what, tall, lanky, left-handers. Yeah. But, you know, neither one of them has, like, a 100-mile-an-hour fastball or whatever. They have similar stuff, so they have to pitch in similar ways. But I honestly think that Jordan Montgomery's got a better curveball than Andy Pettit ever had. Andy Pettit was a fastball Fair. cutter changeup guy. He would throw a backboard, uh, backdoor breaking ball. If you go back and watch the classics, he'll throw it once, tw- once or twice a game. It's kind of like a show me pitch. But Jordan Montgomery is picking up that cutter. He's learning from Andy Pettit. And if he can master that pitch, he's going to have another weapon in addition to what Andy Pettit so, has. I also got to say, I'm loving, I, I, know, I know that this guy polarizes people. Domingo Herman looks unhittable to me. He looks unhittable, no. Patrick. I know, and it sucks in the sense of, like, I really wasn't rooting for the guy going into the spring. Like, I don't think anybody really was. Uh, but it sucks because, like, I really want to see Debbie Garcia still get that fifth rotation spot. And it seems like as the days go by, it's kind of getting, like, less likely. Um, but even though, like, Domingo Herman is having an exceptional spring, I still think I might be in the minority here, but I still think Debbie Garcia should get that fifth man rotation spot to uh, start the spring. Yeah, I mean, he's pitching really well. He's, I think, uh, got a 2.25 ERA. He's been striking guys out a lot. I think the Yankees are going to consider a six-man rotation to start out just because they've got They should. Yeah, and and let's talk about that for a minute. I mean, there's a lot of virtue in doing that because Jamison Tyone and Corey Kluber are both coming back from injuries. They both haven't pitched a lot. The one guy that that, that would affect – uh, a little bit more than I would like is Garrett Cole because he's a he's a guy who wants to get the ball every fifth day and you're paying him thirty six million dollars he deserves to get the ball yep. every fifth day, but I could see a, a a spot where they for the first couple weeks of the season at least while it's cold while guys are still getting ramped up, I could see them going with a six man rotation through like the third week of April and then by then maybe somebody's not pitching as well or somebody has a little nagging thing and needs to miss a start or two. You know, a lot of times in April, guys will get things like blisters because, you know, you, you haven't pitched with that kind of intensity. And when you start throwing like 100 pitches a game, you can get blisters. You can get little nagging things. You can get, uh, you know, hit by a comebacker on the shin or something. Just something where you need to miss a start yeah. or two. David Cohn got bit by a dog, and that allowed uh, that allowed El Duque to step in in 1998. And he, was, and he never left the rotation after that. So things sort of worked themselves out a lot. Uh, with the rotation, but if everybody's healthy three or four weeks into the season and all six guys are pitching pretty well, then, I mean, it's a really good problem to have. And I think you just kind of play it by ear, but the Yankees yeah. showed a couple years ago with Clint Frazier, when they sent him down, when he was basically having an all-star season at that point, you remember he got off to a really good start. They had to send him down because everybody came back. The Yankees aren't afraid to send somebody down if they have options. And if, if, if the other guys are performing, but the thing I that gets me about Domingo Herman, and I've said this extensively on my channel, is his changeup is vastly improved. We already know, we saw the curveball last week, and we know he's got the mid nineties fastball. And he's by the way another guy who wore down in his first season, so maybe he could 
use a six man rotation to start, you know, and Davies, a small guy, he's small of stature. I'm start. I'm talking myself into the six man rotation thing, but for me, for me, Domingo Herman's change up is the difference maker. Yeah. I mean, I'm a firm believer in, in that six man rotation idea. Um, just in the sense of Corey Kluber, James Thion, they haven't pitched in two years. Uh, the Yankees definitely are going to push them too hard, especially to start the season. Um, I would think it, it would make even more sense for when Luis Severino eventually comes back too. I mean, because who are you going to take out of the rotation then? So I think six man rotation this season. Um, I I don't think that it's something they could like set in stone, but it's definitely something that they that they should experiment with, especially very early on for sure. We're getting a lot of chat right now, a lot of chatter about Greg Bird. Did you see he had a walk-off home run yeah. for the Rockies the other day? I did. It was the, probably the announcers made it the most uneventful walk-off <laughs> home run in history. Did you see that somebody uh I don't I think it might have been John Boy like paired it with the swing and a drive to right from the from the uh playoffs. I, didn't see it. I laughed funny, so hard. That was hilarious. I'm really rooting for Greg Bird. I, he's got he first of all, he's rocking the beard now, as most people do. He's got that mountain man yeah. look. I always thought no batting gloves. Right. Uh, he no. better not. He's gonna hurt his hands <laughs> now. He's gonna start growing. Maybe, so, maybe he's a little bit more durable now. Maybe. So I've I've got a theory about Greg Bird, and this is this is a stick with me, guys, for a second because there's a long this is a long story. It's a long denouement, but it's got a. You know, it, I'll make my point. Uh, back in I want to say it was 2012. Uh, Obama debated Mitt Romney and it was in Colorado and Obama showed up like an hour before the debate and he had a miserable debate performance. And then afterwards, everybody was speculating, well, the, the air and the pressure and everything, they were making all these excuses and, uh, saying that like the environment in Colorado threw him off. And I thought about, it, I was like, yeah, they really can. And then I thought about this. Greg Bird is from Colorado. He played his entire life. Yeah, he played his entire entire life in Colorado, and he left that complete that that environment where the air is thinner, and he went to sea level New York, and I mean, I don't want to blame his injuries on that, but you know maybe just being in an environment where you're more comfortable playing, you can breathe a little easier. You know your fly balls carry a little bit further instead of dying at the warning track. You know maybe it's just uh, he's he's playing from home. I think. I think he's going to do well in Colorado. And I actually had a thought a couple of years ago when he was struggling with the Yankees, Colorado should trade for him because I think going home and playing in the thin air and just being comfortable in that environment, I think it'll do wonders for him, for his health. So that's, that's my, I guess the, the Daniel Ma wasn't as great as I had hoped, but I just had to yeah, start with the we'll Obama see. story because it was like a weird, because it was like a weird thing. Like the environment threw him off and leaving an environment can throw you off too. And that was kind of my point. But Lori C says, Lori C is like getting all the, the freaking <laughs> laughter tonight. She's usually uh, Futai gets the laughs. F- Futai I don't think Futai's Futai's here tonight. F- I saw Futai. Futai's on here. Uh, oh, is more durable than Carl Pavano. I don't think there's anybody less durable than Carl Pavano. Carl Pavano was. What about Ellsbury? El- Ellsbury was pretty bad too, man. Oh, yeah. God. He was just. Oh. But Carl. Like, Ellsbury at least played a couple of seasons. Carl Pavano played <laughs> half of one season. And then took the rest of this contract off until he was about to be a free agent again. And then pitched just well enough to get a contract. And, and then, of course, he tears it up with the Twins. But the Yankees beat yeah. him in the playoffs. Yeah. Uh, anyway. All, all right. So I feel like I feel like this was a pretty, pretty solid little late spring episode. I'm going to give you 12 minutes back. I appreciate everybody who joined the chat. Uh, this is a really fun time. I, I'm not sure if we're going to get to it next week. But we're definitely going to go on at least one more time before the season starts. So. Uh, go listen to Pat's channel, uh, Unhinged Yankees. I'm going to be joining on Saturday night, right? Yes. Is yes. 9, 9 p.m. Yep. Yeah, 9 p.m. every night. Uh, we go live. So yeah, come stop by tonight in like an hour. Word. Saturday. Saturday is actually my wife and I. We're doing uh, our annual watch of Titanic. That's my wife's favorite movie. She saw it eight times in the theater, and I was like, a, like a big fan of the eight. Titan- yeah. A lot of I don't think I've been to the theater eight times in my life. <laughs> no joke. I, I was a big fan of the Titanic growing up, and I just like the history part of the, the movie. I don't really care for the Romeo and Juliet love story part, but I just love the movie. So we watch it every year in the spring. Usually we watch it on April 15th, but since I'm doing baseball this year, and I'm probably going to be like 
no like heads down and in, in videos and stuff like that we're watching it before the season starts we always make a little filet mignon because that was the last thing on the menu uh the night the ship sank so hey it is what it well, is you're I, like a titanic historian i am man I, i'm a big fan i'm a big fan <laughs> All right, everybody. Appreciate it. Thanks for watching. Please like and subscribe. Go follow Pat's channel. I'll see you next time.